Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our talk about monetizing your Roku channel. Uh, first things first, let's do introductions. Uh, my name is Dima. I am a backend engineer and my co-speaker Mark is an SDK engineer. We both work at Revenue Cat. And we work on uh, basically simplifying in-app purchases across various platforms like App Store, Play Store, Stripe, Amazon, etc. Uh, over the past few months, we've been working on adding support for the Roku Pay platform. And we wanted to come in today and talk to you about basically our learnings throughout the process, share best practices, tips and tricks that we learned along the way. Uh, so let's talk about our agenda. We've done speaker introductions. Uh, the rest of the talk is basically going to be broken down into two main parts. Uh, so we'll basically motivate the talk a little bit by talking about the app monetization market. Uh, and then we will discuss some strategies that are used for monetizing apps. And this is not platform specific, but from there we will delve into Roku specific monetization strategies. And we will show you how you can integrate with Roku Pay uh, with a sample implementation and code. Uh, and finally, we'll talk a little bit about best practices, those recommended by Roku and some of the stuff that we learned along the way. All right, so before we dive in to how you can monetize your Roku channel, let's, as I said, talk, take a moment, understand why you should care, right? So consumers spend on digital goods and services, and this is people who are paying for bits and bytes. This is soaring and it's projected to hit uh, 2.2 trillion US dollars in 2030, up from 1.7 trillion dollars in 2024. And this encompasses things like uh, gaming, streaming, virtual uh, education, health apps, etc. And now if we zoom in onto a key, um, basically component of this market, which was in-app subscriptions, we'll see even faster growth. Uh, so between 2020 to 2030 consumer spend on subscriptions across platforms is predicted to grow at a compound annual rate of 20%, right? So consumers basically are willingly willing to pay for digital services overall, and there's no component of the market that's growing as fast as in-app subscriptions. So let's talk about how you can monetize your Roku channel. Let's explore the three main app monetization strategies. First, we have paid apps, where users pay a one-time fee upfront at the point of install and get full access to the app without further payments. Second, we have advertisements. In this case, the app is free to install and revenue comes from displaying ads within the app. This works well, especially for apps with high engagement or long sessions. And third, we have in-app purchases. This includes both subscriptions, where the user pays a recurring fee, such as a monthly or yearly subscription, and one-time purchases, like buying a movie to own or renting it one or multiple times. These strategies are not mutually exclusive. They can be mixed, for example, combining subscriptions with ads to boost revenue. But if you're listening to this, you likely work on a Roku channel. So let's now look at how each model applies to Roku and see their pros and cons so you can use the one that best fits your business. First, we have pay to install channels. This is the simplest model. Users pay upfront to download your channel, developers keep 80% of the revenue, and Roku takes 20%. So what are some of the pros of this model? Well, first, you get paid upfront in one lump sum, which should cover the cost of acquisition and your margin. Second, users only pay a fixed fee, but because it is a one-time payment, these channels usually carry a higher price. Third, the business model is straightforward. You charge for the install and Roku handles the payment processing. However, there are some cons too. Some users may hesitate to pay upfront without trying the content first. And this could limit the number of downloads that you get. Also, because users pay upfront, they expect high quality content and a great user experience right away. 
Plus, they might expect to continue receiving value from your channel for a long time after purchase. This puts pressure on the developer to keep delivering value. If you're offering a free or a freemium app, ads are an excellent way to monetize. Roku provides an advertising framework built right into their SDK. You manage your own ad server and demand, but 30% of your ad inventory must go to Roku. And you keep 100% of the revenue from the remaining 70% of inventory. Well, some of the pros. First, a free app always attracts more users, which means there is more opportunities for, that, for ad impressions. Second, ads provide a recurring revenue stream, especially if your users return frequently to your app. Third, you manage your own ad server and inventory, so you decide exactly how ads are displayed and monetized. But it also has some cons. Like for example, the first one, ads can negatively impact the user experience if they are not managed carefully. Users may get frustrated with too many interruptions and that can make them not come back to your app. Second, you'll need to set up and manage your own ad server, which can be complex and resource intensive. And third, you must allocate 30% of your ad inventory to Roku, which means you cannot monetize that portion. The third strategy is in-app purchases like subscriptions or one-time payments powered by Roku Pay, where Roku takes a 20% fee of the revenue. Some of the pros, well, first, you can choose between recurring subscriptions with monthly or yearly periods or one-time purchases, which give you a lot of flexibility. Second, in-app purchases, especially subscriptions, generate a recurring revenue stream which ensures you can create a sustainable business long-term. Third, Roku simplifies payments by handling credit card processing, currency conversions, and taxes, so you can focus on delivering value to your users. They also provide server APIs to help you analyze user behavior and improve your app. But it's not without its cons. First, getting users to commit to purchase can be difficult, especially in competitive app categories. You need to leverage free trials and introductory offers. And even after they have subscribed, you will need to constantly engage users and deliver value to prevent them from unsubscribing. Second, just like with any platform, Roku will take a percentage of your revenue and you'll need to adjust your pricing strategy to remain profitable. Third, some users might find navigating the paywalls and purchase flow frustrating and difficult, so make sure your purchase process is intuitive and easy to use to convert users. In summary, there is no silver bullet. Each monetization method comes with its own pros and cons. Pay to install offers immediate revenue but limits your reach. Ads expand your audience, but can impact user experience and require backend management. And Roku Pay supports subscriptions and one-time purchases, but complicates pricing and conversion strategies. At the end of the day, your best approach depends on your app's content and your target audience. But Roku gives you the tools to implement all of them. Now, Let's go deeper into one of these strategies and see how you can integrate subscriptions in your channel using Roku Pay. Let's break down the core components Roku provides out of the box. First, we have the Roku channel, which is your application. This is where your content lives, and it's the main entry point for users interacting with your content. Next, the Roku developer dashboard. This is where you manage and configure all the details of your products, like prices, offers, trials, subscriptions, and billing settings. Then the ThingGraph channel store node, 
This is the component that's part of the Roku SDK and provides built-in support for Roku Pay. It provides APIs to check previous transactions, as well as several UI flows to allow your users to make new purchases. Moving on to Roku Web Service APIs, these are a set of APIs that allow you to manage transactions, retrieve purchase data, issue refunds, and handle other payment-related tasks programmatically from your backend. Lastly, real-time push notifications, which alert, to, alert you via webhooks to updates in transactions, allowing your app to quickly manage purchase events, renewals, and cancellations. For a basic Roku Pay integration that only handles subscriptions and does not require a backend, all you need are the top three elements, a Roku channel, the developer dashboard, and the channel store node. Now let's see how to build a basic Roku Pay subscription integration without a backend. We'll assume you already have a published channel and have set up some subscription products in the dashboard. Here is an outline of the basic flow, and we'll break down each step with code examples later. In step one, we initialize the essential Roku Pay components, including the channel store node. In step two, we get the purchase history to see if the user has previously made any purchases. In step three, we fetch the catalog and retrieve all available products, including subscriptions with details like price, title, and description. In step four, we check the entitlements, verifying if the user already has access to any products, ensuring they can consume the content. In step five, we display the paywall to show users the available products and guide them to the correct purchase option. Finally, in step six, we make an order. This is where we confirm the user's purchase, make sure the payment is successful, and update the user's account. This process allows you to handle Roku Pay transactions on the client side without needing a bucket. Let's dive into each step in more detail. On the first step, we set up the channel store SYNGGRAPH node. It is important to only initialize one channel store per application. So I recommend adding it to your main scene component and access it where necessary by giving it a descriptive ID. Next, we need to get the previous purchases. To do this, we retrieve the channel store node using its ID. Then we start observing the response to the get all purchases command and execute it. When we get a response, we store all the previous purchases in the context in an associative array indexed by the project's code. Next, we fetch the available products from the catalog. Again, we retrieve the channel store node using its ID. Then we start observing the response to the get catalog command and execute it. When we get a response, we store all the catalog purchases in the context in an associative array indexed by the product code. Next, we check if the user is already entitled to some product based on their previous purchases. Given a product, we check if we have previously purchased it and if the purchase still has a value status. If it does, we grant access to the content. If the user does not have access, we would have shown a paywall to let them purchase a subscription. And if the user initiates a purchase from the paywall, we need to create an order. To do that, we create a content node, add the code of the product and the quantity, and execute the order. Because we had already started observing changes to the order status field, we get notified when an order happens. 
If the status of the order is successful, we can reload the previous purchases and the catalog and potentially grant access to the user. So to sum up, in step one, we set up the channel store SyncGraph node. This initializes the XML component that interacts with RockPay. In step two, we run get all purchases to load the user's purchase history. In step three, we call get catalog to load the current subscription options configured in the Roku dashboard. In step four, we verify if the user's previous purchases are still valid, and if they are, grant access, and if not, we continue to the next step. In step five, we display the paywall, making sure to follow Roku's UI best practices. Finally, on step six, we execute the order, which completes the transaction of the product selected in the paywall. If successful, access is granted. We've shared the complete sample app on GitHub, and I'll provide the link at the end of the presentation. But what happens if you want access to more features and a deeper integration with Roku Pay? Well, in that case, you may need to build a backend. All right, so let's add a backend. But first, we saw that you can do this completely client side, and it begs the question of why add more complexity. And there are quite a few reasons. Uh, I'm going to break them down into technical and business. So let's start technical, right? There are at least some operations that are not currently supported on Roku devices. So let's say you want to issue refunds or you want to change the billing cycle for one of your users. You're going to need to do this on your own backend by talking to the Roku web APIs. Another thing is, say you want to know in real time if somebody disables auto renewal or something and you want to send them an offer, something to entice them to come back and subscribe again to your app. Well, the only way for you to know about this happening in real time is if you have your own backend and you have uh, push time, uh, push notifications enabled in real time. Uh, a third aspect is if your app is cross-platform, it's absolutely essential that you are keeping track of your customers and making sure you're giving them the entitlement on all the other platforms. So for example, let's say I sign up for YouTube Premium online, but then I go on my phone and I log into the app and now I expect to have the exact same features that I paid for on my phone, even though I paid on the web. And the way for you to do that is through a backend. And let's talk about business reasons. So at the very basic level, you wanna understand what your users want, right? What are they interested in? Make more of that. If something is not a hit, make less of it. You also wanna track your revenue, maybe even predict future revenue. And if you don't wanna be waiting X amount of time to download a financial report. If you want to know things in real time, you're going to need a backend and you're going to need to have uh, push notifications enabled. Uh, there are also some other things you want to understand about your business, right? For instance, uh, the funnel, your user funnel. So it's not really enough to know how many people downloaded your app, installed your channel. You want to know of those people, how many people actually went and created an account? Of those who created an account, how many started a free trial, for instance. Of those who started the trial, how many actually converted to pay full price for your subscription? Uh, maybe you wanna know also how many users are churning, what percentage is it? Can you correlate this churn for, with specific builds, specific paywall, specific pricing, etc.? All of that needs a backend. And another thing is pricing. So you wanna set the price for your app at a level that you know people are willing to pay for, you don't want to set it too low because then it'll be difficult later to raise your prices. And if you have a backend, that means you can experiment um, and you can figure out what pricing people are willing to pay. And this could be different across regions, across certain demographics, etc. cetera. Uh, and speaking of experiments, you can also apply that to other things. So you could experiment with a paywall design, with what features you're offering, all that stuff. And finally, again, you're running a business, uh, you probably are keeping, trying to keep track of how it's doing, and you might want to integrate with third parties, right? Like Google Analytics, or maybe even you have your own in-house built-in charts, analytics, etc. In order to integrate with all of those, you're going to need your own backend. 
All right, so what would it look like? What would the system look like if we had a backend? So was, what Mark was talking to you about was basically the first part, which is you have a user is making purchase through your Roku channel, your Roku channel talks to the channel store, you get back a purchased ID. All of that is done. But now is where your backend comes into play. So you want to send to your backend the purchase ID, maybe customer ID, uh, could be also other information. So maybe if you have consent, you can send some specific demographic information. Uh, maybe you want to send what features the Roku device supports, uh, what the store, the country store is, right? Um, and all of this gets sent to your backend. The first thing your backend should do is go talk to the Roku web APIs and validate that this transaction that you just received is not fraudulent. Once you do that and you receive confirmation back from Roku, you can persist this information in some sort of data store. And from here is basically where you can integrate into third parties or your own built-in thing for analyzing your business, I don't know, ETLs, charts, whatever. Um, you can dispatch now events after you have persisted them, you can start dispatching things. And you should keep in mind that you need to have push notifications enabled because that's really the only way for you to know if something happens. So if there's a billing issue that happens or if there's a renewal, etc., that's the only way for you to know about it in real time. And that also enables you to then dispatch the same information to your third parties or to your own systems. All right, so let's talk about best practices and tips. Uh, I wanna start by talking a little bit about the official Roku best practices. This is not a full list. I would recommend you keep an eye out on the store documentation because it's a sort of truth. It'll always be more up to date. And I did want to call out three different points. First of all, add free trials and discounts to existing products, meaning don't go and create an entirely, you know, a new product to represent the discount. And that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, the more products you have, the, you know, the more complex it becomes to manage your inventory. So just keep things simple for your sake. Second of all, Roku, uh, has built-in support, right, to help you determine eligibility for free trials and discounts. So you don't have to do that on your own if you're using the built-in functionality of free trials and offers with the same within the same product. If you're doing it with separate products, then now you have to do that on your own. And third of all, once a discount product period is over, then now your user has to technically upgrade into a different product, and that's a, a bit confusing. Uh, tip number two, simplify your paywall, right? You want your users to be able to know what you're offering at a glance. So minimize the number of options, make sure it's very clear how much they're going to pay and what they're getting out of it. And tip number three is sync daily with the Roku web uh, APIs, specifically the validate transaction endpoint. So, and this is because sometimes, you know, there'll be billing issues, right? Uh, the credit card payment will decline and you want to be able to know if that happens and if you need to revoke access from your subscriber. Or maybe, you know, there was a billing retry and it succeeded. Now you want to make sure that you are continuing to give access to your subscriber. Uh, so you need to do this daily, but please keep in mind rate limits, right? Uh, and also you might want to do this at night because you'll have less traffic through your app. All right, so let's talk about our own recommendations. Tip number one, always have a backend. I talked a whole bunch about this, so I'm not going to go back into it, but backend is very important for your business. Uh, tip number two is basically experiment with pricing. Uh, from the start, take into account what markets you're going to be selling because you might need different pricing per market. Also, don't just assume that a subscription model will be sufficient. Uh, you know, you might be making more money if you have the subscription model and also allow users to make one-time in-app purchases, you know, like rent a movie or something like that. Uh, don't be afraid to do other experimentation, like different paywall layouts, uh, different offerings, different trial periods, etc. Tip number three is define your KPIs. Just basically understand what's important to, your, to you and your business. And don't forget to factor in some stuff, for instance, like refund lag. So if you're only looking at initial conversions and you know, a refund comes in a month later, you will list that information if you're not looking at the whole picture. Tip number four is integrate with third parties like Google Analytics, as I mentioned earlier, I know, Braze, Branch, your own built-in tools, 
to help grow your business and invest in ad attribution. To wrap up, here are a few tips that we've learned while building the revenue cat SDK for Roku. While brighter script is useful, many developers prefer pure bright script code bases. So to avoid making things more complicated for them, you can stick with bright script. Since your library is just one part of the app, limit entries that you store in the global context. It's recommended to always prefix keys to avoid collisions with other entries. If your app requires a task to perform network requests or any other reason, create it programmatically and add it to the main scene so that there is no need to ask for the user to create it. Move the logic that does not use SyncGraph components outside of the app so you can test it quickly uh, on the desktop and continuous integration using BRS engine without a device. But remember to always test on a real device before release, as the behavior can change from the desktop. For UI tests on device, Roibos is a solid option. And when distributing your library, provide a raw PM package, but also offer a manual installation process with as few files as possible. Finally, here is some links. The first one is to the official Roku Pay best practices. Second one is our demo app integrating Roku Pay. And the third one is our open source Roku SDK for in-app purchases. Thank you so much. Okay. Are we ready? Yes. All right. We are ready for question and answer um, portion of the presentation. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've got the Revenue Cat team here to answer some of the questions that have been submitted. So we're just going to start at the top. Our first question, why is it important to only make one channel store node? What issues can happen if this is not followed? I, I think I can answer that question. Um, I think the issue is that uh, probably the underlying implementation shared uh, like the same uh, components. So if you uh, start uh, like one purchase or one query, one command uh, in one channel, uh, you it could arrive in the second one or it could arrive out of the order. So it's better that you uh, listen to the same, uh, to, to just one uh, channel, channel store. Um, it is possible, I think it's possible to listen uh, to the ID of the channel store uh, component when, when you receive the, the response, but by centralizing it in just one, uh, I found that it was much easier for me to uh, reason and understand what's going on. Okay, awesome. Um, next question. Any insights on user behavior trends related to in-app purchases and subscriptions through Roku Pay or Revenue Hat? Well, oh, we, I think we, just we do have an entire, uh, yeah, uh, we have entire reports that is uh, state of subscriptions uh, and, and app uh, stuff. That's, uh, I, I think it's on the website somewhere uh, for 2024. Yeah, it currently doesn't cover Roku because we only started working with Roku very recently, uh, but it covers uh, like in-app subscriptions uh, more broadly, uh, but there are like uh, quite a few uh, insights that might be interesting there. Okay, great. All right, next question. How much time did it take to spin up this integration? <laughs> Where to go for it, Dima? Uh, a couple of months, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know, Mark. Yeah, uh, I think it's been like since inception, like six months ago or so, like we started uh, you know, like thinking about about this uh, integration, and then uh, like purely on implementation time, uh, it, it's closer to two or three months probably. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Our next question: By doing this integration, are you able to experiment more and in and in integrate with other platforms? 
yes uh because the um the integration basically is just um it's kind of an interface so you can just the whole idea is to be able to use um your app without changing much code uh, regardless of what platform you're on and then also on the back end, there's like implementations, as Dima mentioned, uh, where you can integrate with other third parties uh, without having to integrate, you know, in your app directly. Uh, you can go via the, the back end and integrate with, with other analytic services or different types of third party services. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, our next question we've got from Tony, are there rate limiting considerations when working with Roku Pay Web APIs, and how should we handle these limits in high traffic scenarios? Uh, I believe there is, but I think that might be better left for uh, Roku to officially answer. I think. Yeah, um, we do have um, we do have Web API limits. Um, that would definitely be a question that um, Gigi and Dennis would have answered on one of our earlier panels, but. Um, I will see if I can get a response. And if I can get one here in a couple of minutes, I'll just go ahead and shout it out during the rest of the Q&A. That's good. Um, all right, next question. You mentioned to avoid brighter script over bright script. Were you mostly talking about distribution code? Yeah, so all my tips uh, regarding the, the SDK implementation were specifically uh, our experience while developing an SDK that uh, like other apps are going to integrate, right? Uh, so I, I found that, that uh, maybe using writer script, while it would be nice to get some of the niceties that it gets, uh, I don't know if the app that is going to integrate my SDK is written in write script or not. And if it is not, uh, then I would be adding a bigger dependency uh, on the app. Right. And um, when you're an SDK, you want to keep your dependencies at the minimum so that your footprint and your uh, you know your your footprint in, in the in the end app is as minimal as possible and the integration as well is is uh, as easy as possible. Okay, awesome. All right, next question. Can you discuss your process of testing RPay API integrations? Um, uh I'm, I'm not sure I understand in, uh, in the, the question. question. Yeah. Um, Tony, if you want to reply to this question through Slido and give a little bit more context, we can come back to it if you're still here um, in chat in the live stream. Um, I will skip to another question and then we can see if we can come back to that. Um, okay, so this question was from Samuel. So while using the APIs, how are you managing rate limits and batching calls? Uh, so this is, I think, is revenue cap, like implementation specific, but um, we do have ways on the back end of making sure that we're keeping track of how often we're refreshing something. So you, when you have one transaction, you don't really need to keep refreshing, right? Uh, once a day or maybe once every two days is sufficient. So basically, you just need to keep track of that. OK. All right, so this question is from David. Haven't used the Roku Pay APIs yet, but if you hit the rate limit, does it take down your service for a length of time? Um, let me also see if I can get uh, an answer from somebody on our team, as this is more specific for um, are our pay folks than it is for revenue cap. Um, let me, let's, let's look at Stu's question. All right. So Stu asked, I want to give a service credit to a user in a VAT country like the UK. Suppose the total price is 10 units and the price shown is shown as seven units to which I give three units VAT is added. What service credit do I give the user? Seven units or 10 units? I think this is also an RPA question and not a revenue cut question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let me tuck this one off to the side too. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, let's look at Hamilton's question. What do you do to ensure data consistently between the backend app and Roku services? Um, so 
basically the SDK, when there's a purchase that happens, sends this information to the backend. The backend immediately uh, holds the validate transaction API for the Roku to confirm that this is this is the correct transaction. We persist this data and we basically, we have push notifications enabled so that we're in sync. So if we receive something that says, you know, a new event happened, then we can call validate transaction again. Okay. Awesome. All right. So we've got a um, question from Sam. By doing this integration, are you able to experiment more and integrate with other platforms? Yeah. So what, one of the benefits uh, that, that the revenue card platform offers on top of the a basic Roku Pay is that we have some uh, experimentation and A-B testing um, uh, uh, uh features right so you can immediately like change the uh, offer the product that you offer in your paywall uh, immediately um without needing to like release any version of your app for example um we offer integration with third parties automatically so that you can send analytics data um we offer uh, like all kinds of analytics data directly real time on your on your on our dashboard so that you can see real time the amount of purchases that uh, happen in your app there's anything going on. So basically all the benefits that Dima uh, explained of why you would want to implement a backend, uh, Robinicat kind of like gives you that out of the box, let's say. Okay, awesome. All right, we've got another question. Please make the in-app product list with a stable sort order. Oh, it's not a question, it's a statement. It's a request. <laughs> <That's your laughs> Um, it's the most annoying dev portal screen when you have a lot of products. I think this is actually directed towards us. So, um, we made an announcement yesterday about catalog 2.0, and I believe that catalog 2.0 is a solution to this is what, um, I'm being whispered. So I would say check out yesterday's presentation, um, that our Roku pay team shared where they talked about catalog 2.0, and that should be a solution to um, your annoyances. <laughs> All right, um, I've got a question from Hamilton. What approach did you take to ensure scalability and performance considering the potential high volume of SKUs? Um, so I think this is, part of it is the way ReplicaCat is built, right? Because it's, we have to build for scalability. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to say that I'm not sure how high you're expecting volume in terms of like SQs, right? Because Roku supports monthly and annual subscriptions. So you're not really going to be getting like, I, I don't know how many users are on your channel, but you're not really going to be getting millions of requests. So it's not really necessarily an issue. Okay. All right. We, let's see, um, question from Samuel. Could you discuss any unique challenges you encountered with Brightscript's type system when building your backend integration? Oh, well, first for me, I, I hadn't even heard, like barely heard about, uh, I live in, in Europe, so I barely have heard about Roku uh, six months ago. Uh, so the whole platform and the language was uh, very new for me. Um, it, at, at the beginning, some things uh, were a bit awkward with the, with the language, but then I started to appreciate like how flexible it is and how quickly, uh, you can navigate, uh, like you can experiment with the code. Um, uh, at the same time, we, we had to, uh, you know, take a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, um, uh, checks and, 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 and precautions, uh, because being an SDK, you never know how your user is going to. Uh, call your APIs, right? So we had to make sure that the API um, surface was uh, very, like as small as possible, as contained as possible. Although, and also to make sure that all the data that we get through those APIs uh, is is correct. Um, that That's with regards to the application that, that integrates through the DK. And like, oh, of course, TypeScript does not give you a lot of type uh, insurances, but we still managed to get uh, things uh, in control. And regarding the backend, uh, we uh, we just use the JSON APIs and HTTP calls. In that regard, it's very easy because you can very 
easily convert an associative array into a JSON. So in that regard, we didn't have much problems. Okay, awesome. Um, we've got a question. What are the community projects that were valuable in this development process? Um, just an excuse to shout out the best community projects. It's my face. <laughs> well, um, I think one thing that I, I valued a lot since the beginning was being able to uh, quickly iterate because our SDK does not use SYNGRAPH components. Uh, so we were able to uh, run uh, quickly run tests uh, using BRS engine on the desktop. And because it, we don't need to uh, deploy to a device, it was very quickly, uh, the, the, the development cycle was, was very quick and that helps us a lot. Um, and also to integrate in continuous integration. Um, we uh, adapted a, a library called uh, Roca for uh, unit testing as well. Um, and made it play nice with uh, with BRS engine, and that way we were able to uh, write a lot of tests. Which, when you're in, uh, when you're writing an SDK, is very important. Um, what else? Uh, we leveraged um, a library called Fetch, I think, uh, for HTTP requests. Uh, that was very useful because otherwise I would have to, have to uh, figure out all the HTTP uh, stack uh, from scratch, and and that was very useful. Um, and of course, all the uh, Visual Studio um, uh, extensions and tooling uh, was very, very useful in order to deploy the app and to, um, you know, breakpoints and debug the code very easily. That helped uh, a lot as well. Probably missing something, but yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, and I think we've got we've got one more question, and this this might be one that I give to one of our internal teams. A Roku device call to the back end following a purchase typically arrives after the push notification, though with an AWS Dynamo DB consistency limit. Can we adjust push timing? I think this is a question on our end. Um, I will forward this to one of our our pay team members. But um, other than that, unless we've got anything that's weeks in here in the next few seconds um we are almost at time for this panel anyway um i want to thank all of you so much for joining us and for your time and for the presentation um and is there do you all want to shout yourselves out a way to reach you um are you in the roku developer slack or how do you want to promote yourself in your uh <laughs> Well, I think we're both in the um, Roku developers Slack. We're just lurking mostly, uh, but uh, looking forward to um, talk more. And uh, if you're interested in checking out uh, the Rabinikat SDK, it's uh, public on, on GitHub and also uh, our new um, support for Roku as well. You can check more on the on our website, rabinikat.com. And that's it, I think. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we're going to take a short break before we jump into um, our next panel, which is going to cover voice AI gaming on Roku platform. <laughs>